This is the only one of the seven wonders of the world that has survived to this day. They call it the Great One, which seems quite fitting. The scale is truly breathtaking. It's 146 meters, 479 feet high. It consists of 2,300,000 stone blocks. Some of them weigh about 50 tons. The entire structure weighs about 6 million tons. It's like 16 Empire State Buildings combined. And all this was done by people who didn't know the wheel. For 38 centuries, it held the status of the tallest building on Earth. And it remains the most mysterious building, even now. There are so many mysteries, fantasies, and conjectures surrounding it, because it's very ancient. Even its inscriptions were deciphered almost by pure luck. Otherwise, there would be much more secrets and fantasies. This is the Pyramid of Cheops. It was built with amazing precision. The perimeter of its base, divided by twice its height, gives the number pi to the nearest thousandth. Try it yourself on a calculator. It's impressive. Definitely, this wasn't a coincidence since the proportion would have been different if the ancient Egyptians had made the pyramid higher or lower by just a meter. And this was done by people so long ago that no one even heard of the village that would later become Rome. By the way, we greatly underestimate the pyramid's age due to our perception of the distant past. Take the last queen of Egypt, the legendary Cleopatra. She was born in 69 BC, that is 2,090 years ago, or 2,091, whatever. We involuntarily perceive her as the same age as the pyramids. She was the queen of Egypt after all. But the construction of the Great Pyramid ended around 2540 BC, and it started 20 years earlier. That is almost 2,500 years before Cleopatra was born. Just think about it. For Cleopatra, the Pyramid of Cheops was more ancient than Cleopatra herself for you and me. Doesn't this blow your mind? Therefore, we perceive many things about the Great Pyramid's internal structure as something bizarre and mysterious precisely because we are so far from fully understanding how people of that era lived, thought, and what they were driven by. But somehow, we still need to satisfy our boundless curiosity. In this video, you'll find out what's inside and under the Egyptian pyramids, what unusual things were recently discovered there, where are the priceless artifacts and the pharaoh's body, and so much more. What do the Egyptian pyramids hide inside and under them? How can you get inside the pyramid? Initially, there was only one entrance to the Great Pyramid, the one made by the builders. It's located on the north side, 7.9 meters, 25.92 feet east of the pyramid's center line. This distance is equal to 15 royal cubits. The Egyptian measurement system was based on the proportions of the human body. The cubit was the main measurement unit and was equal to the distance from the elbow to the fingertips. So the builders of the pyramids applied the common cubit, while the royal cubit was used to determine the size of the inner rooms with the pharaoh's coffin. But although this is the original entrance, another one is used more commonly, the so-called robber's tunnel. 
Such a strange name comes from the very nature of the passage. It was built no one knows when by robbers who ransacked the tombs for centuries. This happened thousands of years before Lara Croft. And scientists still haven't come to a consensus on when and who got so confused as to gouge a passage as long as 27 meters, 88.58 feet in solid masonry. The robber's tunnel ends with a junction. There is a passage from the original entrance from above that goes down and an ascending passage going up. So let's start our creepy walk with the ascending passage. Why creepy? Because as soon as you go in the aisle, it feels quite unpleasant. And it's not about the curse of the pharaohs or other mysticism. It's just that the passage is narrow, dark and stuffy. The air is stale and heavy. In general, it wouldn't appeal to impressionable people and those who have even the slightest claustrophobia issues. Another junction lies 39.3 meters, 128.94 feet away, and has a horizontal passage and the entrance to the Grand Gallery. Let's go ahead first. The atmosphere is the same, cramped, dark, stuffy and gloomy, but something special waits for us in the end. The horizontal passage ends with the Queen's tomb. Yes, not only Pharaoh Khufu, but also his wife was buried in the pyramid. The Queen's chamber lies exactly in the middle between the pyramid's northern and southern sides. Its dimensions are 10 cubits, or 5.2 meters, 17.06 feet from north to south, and 11 cubits, or 5.8 meters, 19.03 feet from east to west. It has a gable roof, 6.3 meters, 20.67 feet high. At the east end of the chamber, there's a niche, 4.7 meters, 15.42 feet high. It was originally about a meter deep, but treasure hunters have significantly deepened it in the hopes of finding something valuable. Unfortunately, if there was something valuable in the queen's chamber, then it was stolen by robbers long before Herodotus, who is widely known as the father of history. it's easy to understand robbers. In those days, even the pyramid's look hinted at the innumerable treasures inside. Did you know that it didn't look even close to how it looks now? The entire surface was covered with a smooth layer of dense limestone. In some spots, you could still see its remains. And at the very top of each pyramid, there was a pyramidia, a large pyramid-shaped stone possibly covered with gold. If there was gilding, then the pyramidion shone brightly in the sun's rays, crowning the snow-white pyramid and spreading the light of Pharaoh's greatness for tens of kilometers around. This splendor, even in our time, would have dazzled anyone with its magnificence and grandeur. No wonder it attracted the ancients so much. Let's return to the junction and go up the ascending passage again. In a few meters, it connects to the Grand Gallery. Here, you can finally feel lighter and breathe comfortably. Although the passage becomes slightly wider, it already has an impressive height of 8.6 meters, 28.22 feet. In the Grand Gallery, we'll have to go 46.68 meters, 153.15 feet up the slope. Walking all this distance and looking up, you can see the strangely shaped walls in the corridor. They seem to be tilted inward, 
so that at the ceiling, the Grand Gallery is only one meter wide. In fact, this didn't come from lack of consideration, but on the contrary, the utmost care during construction. Thus, ancient engineers meticulously calculated the shape and laying sequence so that the pressure of a giant stone mass from above wouldn't break through the ceiling and block up the passage. The Grand Gallery ends with a small antechamber in front of the most important room, the Pharaoh's Chamber. It was this place that caught the special attention of scientists and enthusiasts fascinated by the ancient Egyptian civilization. The King's Chamber is the topmost of the pyramid's three main chambers. It is completely clad in granite. Its dimensions are 10.5 meters from east to west and 5.2 meters from north to south. The ceiling is flat. The chamber, about 5.8 meters high, and is formed by nine stone slabs, weighing in total about 400 tons. The walls are made up of five rows of granite blocks. There are no inscriptions, which is typical for the burial chambers of the fourth dynasty. The stones are matched with high precision. Facing surfaces are cleaned with varying degrees of thoroughness. The backsides of the blocks were only roughly hewn, as was common with Egyptian hardstone facade blocks. It was probably done to save effort and time. The only object in the king's chamber is a sarcophagus made from a single hollowed out granite block. When it was rediscovered in the early Middle Ages, it was already broken and empty. All of its contents have been looted long ago. If there was any content at all. Hang on a second. What? Don't worry, there are no conspiracy theories. Herodotus also claimed that the Cheops Pyramid was built in the Pharaoh's honor, but he wasn't buried in it. There weren't found any funeral-themed images or inscriptions on the walls of his burial chamber. And in those days, making such inscriptions in a room where no one was buried was considered great blasphemy. Many modern scientists follow this theory, believing that there are still rooms in the Great Pyramid that haven't been discovered, and the Pharaoh's body may rest in one of them. And along with it, the priceless artifacts of an unimaginably ancient and amazing civilization. And by the way, the latest research indicates that all this may turn out to be not far from reality after all. Later in this video, you'll find out what we are talking about. Despite slight frustration that naturally comes from seeing the gaping emptiness of the sarcophagus, very few people remain disappointed when they get into the Pharaoh's tomb. Touching such an unimaginable antiquity, such an original and great civilization is bound to impress you. But this isn't the end of our journey, but only the beginning. From the very top, we still have to go down to the very bottom. To do this, Let's go back to the intersection and go further down the descending passage. Here, you'd have to go the longest distance of 72 meters, 236.22 feet. What makes it special is that most of the way passes not in the pyramid, but under it. The passage is carved into the limestone that served as the natural foundation for the Great Pyramid. What waits for us down there? There is another mystery, an unfinished chamber that is about 27 meters, 88.58 feet below the level of the pyramid's base. Dimensions are approximately 8.4 meters, 27.56 feet from north to south, and 14.1 meters, 46.26 feet from east to west. It is about four meters, 13.12 feet high. 
The mystery is that the chamber isn't small, and the passage is long. Thus, the builders required a huge amount of effort and time to construct. But in the end, the chamber wasn't finished. What could have gotten in the way? And what was the chamber for? There's no single answer to these questions in the scientific community, as this equation has too many unknowns. Many researchers stick to the simplest theories, completely devoid of mysticism or any pretentiousness. For example, a prominent Egyptologist Chris Nountain told in an interview about his vision. According to Nountain, at first, he thought that the chamber wasn't finished because it lost its purpose after the plan had changed. Egyptian monuments were under construction for a very long time, and often what happened was you'd get the king suddenly die. Then it would be a new king, a new project, and they would either dismantle it or build it over. I suspect they were not as bothered by something not being finished said the researcher. Although the underground chamber is rightly considered one of the most mysterious places in the Great Pyramid, at least we can see and explore it. But the studies of the next few years, performed using the muon tomography method, literally shocked the scientific community. It turned out that inside the Pyramid of Cheops, there is at least one large void that we haven't known about all this time. In 2015, a high-tech and very promising Scan Pyramids project was launched. Scientists from universities of Nagoya, Paris, and Cairo were going to use special cosmic particle detectors to find anomalies inside the pyramid you can loosely compare this method with X-rays. In the accessible spaces of the pyramid, scientists placed special, highly sensitive plates that registered massive particles called muons. These particles arrive directly from outer space and pierce the pyramid through, leaving a certain projection of the substance density on the detector plates. And so, in October 2017, the participants of the Scan Pyramids project announced a sensational discovery. They managed to find several previously unknown voids in the pyramid. At least one large cavity was clearly detectable. It lies directly above the Grand Gallery, is at least 30 meters long, and has the same width as the gallery. They even began to speculate that these are the real tombs of the pharaoh and his wife. Archaeologists and Egyptologists flatly refused the idea, accusing physicists of misinterpreting the data. The experiments were replicated many times on different equipment by different teams. The skeptics had to admit the Great Void undoubtedly exists. Unfortunately, five years have passed since then with no further progress. Although back in 2017, this discovery seemed incredibly promising and exciting. Chris Nountain believes that much more can be found there than we know now, including the Pharaoh's remains. Unfortunately, archeologists cannot get inside. The fact is that any attempt to go through the pyramid can cause irreparable damage, and this, of course, will never be allowed by the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities. More mysteries may lie, not even in the Great Pyramid itself, but in its vicinity, and not on the surface, but deep under the desert sands. The topic first received the spotlight in the 21st century. So in 2009, British explorer Andrew Collins said that he had found a whole lost underground world of the pharaohs that was never known before. 
that's it. No more, no less. He claimed that a huge system of caves, chambers, and tunnels was hidden under the pyramids of Giza, a whole underground complex inhabited by bats and poisonous spiders right in the limestone under the pyramids. There is untouched archaeology down there, as well as a delicate ecosystem that includes colonies of bats and a species of spider which we've tentatively identified as the White Widow. Collins said, the researcher didn't discover his find by chance and didn't stumble into it blindly. His research was inspired by the memoirs of the British Council General Henry Salt. In his work, the diplomat told how he and the Italian explorer Giovanni Caviglia explored the underground system of the catacombs in Giza in 1817. The document says that Salt and Caviglia were exploring the caves at a distance of several hundred yards when they came across four large rooms that led to further cave passages. With the support of British Egyptologist Nigel Skinner Simpson, Collins reconstructed Salt's exploration of the plateau. Imagine his astonishment when he did eventually discover the entrance to the lost catacombs in an apparently unknown tomb west of the Great Pyramid. Indeed, the tomb had a crack in the rock that led into a massive natural cave. We explored the caves before the air became too thin to continue. They are highly dangerous with unseen pits and hollows, colonies of bats and venomous spiders. Collins said. Unfortunately, the researcher didn't provide clear evidence, perhaps because of scrutiny reasons. But other Egyptologists drew attention to the lack of specific facts, criticizing Collins' findings. Collins suggested that natural caves, which are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years old, could have inspired ancient Egyptians not only to develop the pyramids, but also their very belief in the underworld. Indeed, Giza was known in antiquity as Rostau, which means mouth of the passages, and it is believed that these passages led to the mysterious space underneath. The mouth of the passages is unquestionably a reference to the entrance to a subterranean cave world, one long rumored to exist beneath the plateau. Collins told Discovery News. Quite expectedly, Collins' statement caused a slight stir, skepticism, and even indignation in the Egyptological community. Zahi Hawass, head of Egypt's High Council of Antiquities flatly denied the discovery. There are no new discoveries to be made at Giza. We know everything about the plateau, he said. But Collins noted that after extensive research, he found no modern mention of caves. To the best of our knowledge, nothing has ever been written or recorded about these caves since Salt's explorations. If Howis does have any report related to these caves, we have yet to see it, Collins said. However, then the topic received little publicity and attention, and everyone quickly forgot about it. Almost everyone. Of course, some enthusiasts continued their research and had to face some challenges along the way and not only because getting permission to access the non-tourist part of the pyramids in Giza is not an easy task. So, eight years after Collins recounts, Dr. Kathy J. Forty, a clinical psychologist and part-time fan of ancient Egypt, took up studying the underworld Giza. She and her colleagues still managed, if not to confirm Collins' discovery, but at least find a lot of interesting things in the dungeons that no one had descended into for many, many years.
The goal of Forty's expedition was to descend into deep mines, which weren't really a secret, but didn't have particular publicity in popular sources. It turned out that it's difficult to obtain permission to explore what's below the Giza Plateau. Negotiations to enter the hidden mines began in 2017. According to Kathy, at first, the Egyptian authorities greeted the team with suspicion. It took them a long time to figure out who they were, what they wanted, and how they even learned about the mines. They claimed that no one had been there for decades. At first, the 40 team was denied access, but then they managed to get permission. By doing so, Kathy unwittingly opened the way for other explorers, proving that it's possible to get into the dungeons, at least on paper, and this isn't strictly forbidden. Forty tells how at 4.30 in the morning, she, along with her partner and a Giza Plateau inspector, wandered through the desert sands to the mine entrance with some flashlights. This was very serious, and they were even accompanied by a military police escort. They were led to a gloomy entrance with an iron gate. The inspector advised them to be careful and said that the group should expect as many as three lower levels. The farthest passages to the water tunnels are over 125 feet, 38 meters underground. The first level opened into a spacious but empty room. The air felt stale and dusty, and the temperature was much warmer than outside due to poor ventilation. The team continued their descent to the second floor, which was the longest one, and was poorly lit. Oddly enough, the room was lit by a regular bulb hanging from the ceiling. It looked very strange, given the overall surroundings. Naturally, the pharaohs didn't install the light bulb. This was done many years ago by unknown workers, and no one remembers what they were doing here. The second room was a room with seven niches for seven large sarcophagi. Only two black basalt and granite sarcophagi remained. Both were empty, with heavy lids ajar. They must have weighed several tons. Where the rest of the heavy lids are is still unclear, although they may not have been there in the first place. It is believed that this room was intended for the chosen ones, the guards, who were usually the highest priests. The room and large cavities in it were discovered in 1993 which is very recent by Egyptological standards. The Osiris mine itself was first discovered even earlier, in 1933 to 1934, by the famous Egyptologist, Dr. Salim Hassan. He claimed that the tomb dates back to the Saite period. This is the 26th dynasty, which was around 600 BC and he called it the most unusual examples of this type of tomb. Others dispute this dating and believe that it goes back to even earlier times. At that time, large-scale research involving expeditions from several countries was conducted in Giza. Some of the described finds make us reconsider many ideas about what's under the pyramids. In 1935, Absolutely incredible stories followed a 10-year project of excavation and clearing the passageways. An article published in the same year by Hamilton M. Wright described vast man-made spaces beneath Giza. The article said, We've discovered a subway used by the ancient Egyptians of 5,000 years ago. It passes beneath the causeway leading between the Second Pyramid and the Sphinx. It provides a means of passing under the causeway from the Cheops Pyramid to the Pyramid of Kephren. From this subway, we have unearthed a series of shafts leading down more than 125 feet, with roomy courts and side chambers. Like many other discoveries, Egyptian authorities deny this information, 
despite the pressing evidence. Let's go back to Kathy Forty's expedition. The last frontier which she and her partner passed led them to the last mine. And here, it became difficult to pass since the mine was flooded. Yes, there was plenty of water in the Egyptian desert right under the pyramid, and it has been here for a very long time. At least it's known that in 1934, the third chamber was already underwater. Dr. Salim Hassan tried to clean the chamber, but after four years of trying to pump it out, the water level hadn't come down, meaning that the source of water here is constant. Local authorities didn't provide any explanations. It's difficult to suspect the Nile River as it's very far away. The group took water samples, and the test results turned out to be quite interesting. The team ordered a series of tests from a certified water analyzing lab in California. Consultant chemists were also brought in to interpret the test results. The biggest surprise for the 40 group was the water salinity. It turned out to be much higher than in the Nile River, but also significantly lower than in the Mediterranean Sea where the Nile flows. One might wonder, how so? The hypothesis that salts got into the water directly from the substance of the tunnel walls was disproven right away as the rock composition was different. So where did this salty water come from? The researchers began to analyze the location of the nearest water bodies, but still came to the most obvious conclusion. The only known lake with salt water in Egypt is Lake Karun which lies 20 kilometers southwest of the Great Pyramids. In prehistoric times, it was a freshwater lake with an estimated area between 490 and 656 miles. The lake's surface lies 43 meters below sea level and covers an area of about 202 square kilometers. We don't know exactly when the lake so radically changed its salinity and why this happened. So here's another tidbit. There is also a complex of pyramids in Kawara near the lake. Even in ancient Greek texts, there were references to an underground complex in Kawara that was called the Labyrinth and had about 12 large halls. Herodotus himself wrote that the labyrinths of Kawara and the Giza Plateau are connected by underground tunnels. This could well explain the origin of the salt water in the Osiris mine at Giza. And there is even evidence that the mines near Giza go farther than the known chambers. Dr. Kathy Forty's expedition discovered an entrance at the lower level, presumably leading to other tunnels. The research reports from the 30s contain the same information. But this, unfortunately, is as far as the answers go. The Egyptian authorities are extremely reluctant to give access to such mysterious places. The reasons are incomprehensible and can be anything from mystical and religious to purely utilitarian and even political. There is an opinion that the Egyptian authorities have a good reason not to open this Pandora's box where people may find something that will undermine established ideas about the history of Egyptian culture and people don't need to know about it. But if and when the restrictions are lifted and the many kilometers of the ancient underground subway network are actually discovered, then one could only envy the Egyptologists of the future. They will be literally swamped with a tsunami of new, absolutely mind-blowing discoveries. <laughs>